This is Macro Voices, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 388 was produced on August 10th, 2023. I'm Eric Townsend. ECRI co-founder Lakshman Achuthan returns as this week's feature interview guest. We'll discuss the business cycle and why the expected recession is taking longer than expected to arrive, before moving on to discuss whether a new secular inflation trend underlies the transitory inflation from pandemic supply chain effects, which is now receding. And I'm Patrick Serezna with the Macro Scoreboard week over week as of the close of Wednesday, August 9th, 2023. The S&P 500 futures were down 115 points, closing at 44.85. We'll take a closer look at that chart and the key technical levels to watch in the post game. The U.S. dollar index down 13 basis points to 102.47, pausing last week's advance just prior to the release of these inflation numbers. The September WTI crude oil contract up 618 points to 84.40, uh, broken now to a new 2023 high. We'll look at that chart in the post game, and Eric will have the EIA inventory data. Gold is down 127 basis points in 1950. The advance has stalled. Will be important to see if the bulls can defend the price action here. Copper down 156 basis points to 378. Dr. Copper continuing to struggle. And uranium unchanged at 5640. That U.S. 10-year Treasury yield down 7 basis points, closing at 401 points, retracing its advance after hitting a 420 high last week. The key news to watch this week is Friday's PPI inflation numbers and the University of Michigan consumer sentiment numbers. Next week, we have the U.S. Retail Sales, the Empire State Manufacturing Index, and Wednesday's FOMC meeting minutes. This week's feature interview guest is Lakshman Achuthan. Eric, why did we get Lak back on the show this week? Well, Patrick, there's been a huge disconnect between the brisk rally in risk assets and the recession and extended bear market calls that our expert macro guests have been making in recent Macro Voices interviews. So when the technicals and fundamentals don't seem to jibe, you got to bring somebody in to break the tie. It's not conclusive, but I want to bring Locke in as the cycles guy to look at how a completely different style of analysis jibes with what other people are telling us. Specifically, is this recession everybody's been waiting for still coming? And is the bear market rally really and truly not over yet? Are there really still deeper lows to come? Uh, I want to get a cycles perspective because we haven't been getting the same signal from the technicals that we're getting on a fundamental level from our expert guests. And Locke is definitely the man for business cycles and market cycles uh, as they affect financial markets. Eric's interview with ECRI co-founder Lakshman Achuthan is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's your host, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is ECRI co-founder Lakshman Achuthan. Lock prepared a slide deck to accompany this week's interview. You'll find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com. Look for the red button above Locke's picture that says, looking for the downloads. Lock two times ago that I last interviewed you was more than a year ago. Uh, I think it was last July. Uh, we had you back on in February, and I want to kind of pick up that conversation because two interviews ago, you had just put on, I think, your recession call saying recession coming. When I interviewed you in February of this year, you reconfirmed that, said, yeah, okay, it took a little longer than we expected, still coming. So I made a mental note to myself, let's wait this out six months. If it hasn't happened yet, we got to get you back on to figure out what's happening. It's been six months. Is this a recession that everybody's predicting still coming? Yeah, I think so. If in fact it's not already here, it's uh, it's unusual for everybody to see a recession when it's starting. Uh, that would be really weird. Typically, uh, people recognize uh, recessions in the rearview mirror, 
um, ourselves included, because the indicators that define recession, uh, output, employment, income, and sales, those all undergo uh, a great deal of revision in the vicinity of recessions. And those revisions occur well after the fact. So you can have an instance where you're inside of a recession and you've never seen, for example, a negative GDP or a negative jobs growth. In uh, the last recession, um, the Great Recession, 07, 09, uh, the first time we saw a negative GDP number. Uh, well, let me just yep. interrupt you for a second there, because since you are not defining the recession itself as being a negative GDP print, you're using a slightly different definition than some people use. Correct. Why are you using that definition? And specifically, why is it that you think basing the, the question of whether or not the economy is in recession on a negative GDP print might actually be misleading? So there's two things. So there's the actual academic, like, are we in a recession or not? And that's defined by uh, the Business Cycle Data Committee that uh, my mentor, Jeffrey Moore, was this, the only member of until 1979. And that's based on output, employment, income, and sales. And are those indicators falling or rising? Is the level of their activity falling or rising? That's how you define the shaded areas that you see on charts, including the charts in our chart deck, the dark, the gray shaded areas. In terms of people's perceptions, right? You have a view on recession. I have a view on recession. The market has a view on recession. Everybody has a view. Are we in recession or not? And what I'm pointing out is that people don't recognize or, or begin to even think that you're in recession until something either hits them in the face, right? It could be like a, a Lehman failure or something like that, or you get sharply negative GDP growth or jobs growth or something like that, right? So I'm just pointing out that in the Great Recession, which began in December of 2007, we know in retrospect, looking at the hard data, in real time, people didn't know we were in recession. In July of 08, people did not know. People did not think we were in recession. Uh, that's pre-Lehman. And GDP was all positive, for example. And it was I think it was July 31st, which was the first time you saw a slightly negative GDP print. I went back and looked. And then in the 70s, switching over to jobs, in the 70s, you had um, jobs growth positive eight months inside the recession, in the mid-70s recession, uh, during a period of uh, high inflation and labor hoarding. And, and both of those things, I think we could argue, are occurring today. So that is why I believe there's this whole soft landing narrative that's so enamored the market right now, uh, even though uh, I'm not convinced that we're not in recession. We could be. Okay, Locke. So it sounds like we are probably already in recession, might not know it. What does that mean, though, in terms of uh, where markets have headed? Because so many of us thought and, and so many of our expert guests have really been echoing the same message of, hey, the bear market uh, bottom's not in yet. This is just a bear market rally. You know, it, it's going to be over anytime soon. We're, we're, we're headed back down on the stock market. That keeps not happening mm -hmm. pretty darn consistently after a lot of smart people predicted it for like a year now. Right. What's going on here? It seems like everybody's missing something. Yeah, I, I take your point. As we've discussed before, there could be plenty, and, and I'm sure other guests have, met, have uh, talked about, there can be plenty of bear market rallies, in particular uh, in and around recessions. Um, that's not unusual. Uh, they can be easily double-digit rallies. This is a big one, right? It's, it's, we're 19-something percent up, I think, off the low. So we're starting to be a kind of a record-breaking bear market rally, if that's what it is. But record-breaking is something you could say about practically all the charts post-COVID. They're, they're really strange uh, cross-currents uh, in the economy uh, post-COVID. And I think it is very confusing. You had mentioned our discussions um, in February and then and then in the so last summer. And just to reset the table here, the cyclical indicators, and, and let's say 
I'm just going to stipulate that EFRI has a pretty good handle on the cyclical indicators. The cyclical indicators uh, did fall in a forward-looking indicators, fell in a recessionary fashion. uh, And we discussed that in July, last summer. Then, subsequent to that, the Fed started to hike in earnest. Okay, so in a way, that lagged effect of those rate hikes is starting now I think, to bite on the economy itself, the actual economic activity. Uh, it could hit the markets quite a bit earlier, and it, and it did. There was a lot of drama around that. But the actual impact as, it, as those higher interest rates propagate through the economy, you know, it's long and variable lags. Uh, people could argue, is it shorter this time? Is it longer this time? I don't know. But here we are about a year out from when they really started to stomp on the brakes, and that's kind of a, a one-two punch in a way. We have this big cyclical decline in the cyclical drivers of the economy. And then the Fed and other central banks put on the brakes. And we've seen in the coincident data, slowdowns everywhere. They're not accelerations. They are slowdowns, including even in jobs, right? Uh, I know jobs growth has been uh, the outlier here, uh, and it continues. But it's slowing. It's been slowing for well over a couple of years now. And the typical kind of cyclical signals that you would see, recessionary signals that you would see out of jobs are beginning to show up. You you have, um, I think you're pushing a a 6% decline in temporary jobs growth. You're you're seeing the work week, the, the, the the, not the growth rate in the work week, but the level of the work week slipping. And when we look at the very cyclical components of uh, jobs, uh, manufacturing is pretty much flat this year. Uh, and construction, the residential side's uh, weak. The non-residential is the one that's bucking the trend. And you know you can pretty much think that that has to do with the fiscal stimulus uh, into factory building and and uh, chips and and uh, batteries and things like that. That there's been a lot of uh, money pushed in there that the private sector has has also uh, jumped on, uh, which has created some positive activity in the non-residential construction area. So that's the lay of the of the land when we look at other coincident measures of the economy, they're pretty much to the downside. And and the deck that, that we brought and are sharing with listeners today kind of speaks to a lot of those uh, cyclical kind of observations you can make about the economy. We talked about the recession cycle. I want to move on now to the inflation cycle, which we also talked about in your last two interviews. Uh, As I remember those, I think that you agreed with my view that we're likely in a new secular inflation to last for many years. I think you actually used the phrase 1970s era inflation to describe what might be coming. Um, You know, I I really feel the same way myself, Locke, but I hate it when I feel things and can't point to data that actually substantiate my feelings, especially when I get smart people like Julia DeClerc and Jeff Snyder uh, on this program, really laying out some pretty good arguments to say, look, this inflation that we just saw really was driven by supply chain effects. It's not a secular inflation like the 1970s. It's all blown over. It's all done with. It's all behind us. It sure doesn't feel that way to me, but I I don't have anything to point to to really substantiate that argument. What are the cycles telling you about this? Well, well, so so in there, I think we have to unpack and, and just recognize that there are, are two different vantage points here. Uh, we could say 70s, kind of that secular decade, maybe from the late 60s to the early 80s, inflation, inflationary backdrop. And that's possible. I think there, there is an argument to be made that, that that can happen. But then on top of that, you have cycles. So we can have big swings. I think during that period of secular 70s inflation, you would have had um, maybe the cyclical lows on inflation uh, around 3%, maybe a little lower. And the cyclical highs, uh, 12% or higher. 
So these massive swings. And I think this to a degree, and we could talk about the Fed and Powell, I think this to a degree is informing at least some of Powell's thinking. But when there's a recession, and and just for the moment, let's stipulate that our base case remains a hard landing. When there's a recession, recession on a cyclical basis will kill inflation. It'll it'll put it down. It's demand destruction. But the question becomes kind of where does it trough? Uh, where does that cyclical downturn in inflation trough? Is it down near the earlier troughs in inflation or is it a higher cyclical low? And in the 70s, what you saw in the inflation cycle there, when it's swinging from three to 12 and back and forth, what you saw is that you were getting higher cyclical lows in inflation as the decade went on, which became very troubling, right? That's when the inflationary kind of mindset, uh, secular inflationary mindset really set in to the point where there was a more popular pushback against inflation. Um, early in the 70s, people weren't that bothered by it. They just weren't that bothered by inflation uh, having moved up. So when we switch from cyclical, and right now our cyclical inflation indicators for the U.S. and around the world have been cycling to the downside. The U.S., as I mentioned maybe earlier in our in our February call, had, had kind of um, not been falling as sharply as other parts of the world. And so it had flattened out a little bit, leading us to anticipate some sticky, so-called sticky inflation, even in within the cyclical decline. And we can get into what's going on there, but you know, there's some wages and, and housing stuff. But on the structural, now I'm switching gears to structural inflation, secular inflation. There's uh, several things that would argue that maybe we get inflation ends up being a little bit more problematic than in the last decade or so. One is productivity growth. I know everybody's excited about AI, but in the meantime, until whenever that makes some meaningful impact on productivity growth, our productivity growth is horrible. And just because the last reading came in a little better doesn't mean anything. When you look over time, over years, uh, or even decades, uh, our productivity growth for services, for manufacturing, and for construction are just embarrassing. It's bad. It's really, really bad. And that means, for example, today, it takes two construction workers to do the same job that one did in the 90s. Now, there are multiple reasons as to why that's true, uh, but that's true. And and that's very very difficult uh, if you're trying to keep inflation down. That's a that's a difficult reality to deal with. Uh, construction productivity is the worst. Manufacturing's uh, in the middle. It's pretty bad. And even services productivity growth has been deteriorating quite a bit. And all of those are inflationary kind of developments, and they eat away at uh, your long term growth potential for the economy. Second, after COVID or with all the geopolitical stuff going on, whatever the reason, there seems to be this shift toward onshoring. Okay. So onshoring is not necessary. It's unclear that that's cheaper. In, in many regards, that could be more expensive. So that's something I would put up there as something to watch uh, the impact uh, on prices from onshoring. Uh, and then probably the the nearest biggest thing to get around is the huge um, kind of hit we took to the labor supply in the United States. And so there's things related to COVID that have limited supply uh, to immigration that have limit, limited the supply of labor and early retirement or whatever's going on with, with people who are right near the retirement age. Whatever it is, the labor supply is very tight. And that's contributing to some of the cyclical confusion as to what's going on with the economy. But structurally, it's unclear how the labor supply all of a sudden gets a lot bigger. And again, that's kind of an inflationary floor support. 
Locke, let me read this back to make sure I've understood what you've said. Do you still anticipate a recession? Yes. Are we already in it? Probably. Is it abnormal to be in it and not realize that you're in it? No, that's perfectly normal. Correct. Is the inflation that we've seen uh, really completely transitory or is it not transitory? Well, it sounds like the answer is we really still don't know. The inflation that we've already seen probably really was all transitory. We have a bunch of setups that you and I agree really should bring about a secular inflation, but we also have a recession call, which by your own description, even if there's a new secular inflation, the recession that's beginning now or has already begun, however you want to think about that, that recession is going to put a lid on any inflation. We're not going to, going to see a major resurfacing of inflation until the recession's over. So it's really not till the recession's over that we find out whether this inflation is really secular or not. But you and I are leaning toward the hunch it is with the qualifier that we don't really have any hard data to prove that with yet. We just have some narratives like, gee, you know what? Locke, I think you and I are in agreement that when we start building stuff using union labor in the United States rather than slave labor in countries like China, it might get more expensive instead of less expensive. Uh, if that proves right, then it just might be that inflation is here to stay. But we're, we're basing that on narratives, not any hard data that we either of us can prove yet. Yeah, I, I I agree with you, right? So we have our we think that weak productivity or negative productivity is inflationary. We think that onshoring is probably inflationary, and we think that tight labor supply is uh, inflationary. And those are and all, don't forget the entire planet running out of spare production capacity for petroleum. But <laughs> all of that, yes, all, go ahead. All of that, you're right. You're right. So all of those things are, are and all of those are kind of longer term structural observations. Now, on top of that, we're, we're mostly running, for most of the world, uh, free market-oriented economies. There's a lot of intervention uh, by governments or whatnot in various ways uh, to try and mess with the cycle that is part of free markets. But that cycle is more powerful. It is more powerful than, than any of these governments or in, interventions. So we're trying to see through all of that. We see cycle downturns. The reason I look to the 70s, I don't have a lot of other examples to look at, but you look at the 70s and we can see the cycles in inflation. And I think the tell will be about the secular inflation. The tell is going to be, where does the inflation cycle bottom around this downturn? Let's set aside whether it's a recession or not. There's some cyclical downturn. I think everybody knows that. The question is, where does this in, uh, inflation cycle bottom before it begins to reaccelerate in a in a pronounced, pervasive, and persistent way? And do you have any levels that you would associate interpretations with? Well, look, it could. What I'm interested in is if it is a higher low, if it's a higher cyclical low than we saw earlier. Now, earlier on, we, we came to almost, you know, very, very low readings of inflation, like, you know, very low single digits. So, you know, the Fed has some target, whatever, it's 2% ostensibly, right? So they want to get to the 2% target. You never land on it, right? They probably shoot through it and then turn back up. The question is, is that trough there higher than the previous low? Because in the 70s, what you saw is that you had, I think, three higher cyclical lows before Volcker came in and, and really put an end to everything. And here we are uh, in the early stages of some something that might be like that. I don't know. And the higher low that you're looking for is a higher low on the CPI print or on the velocity of money or on something else? Well, it could be on consumer prices. It could be on the PCE uh, it could be on producer prices. Those are all going to kind of trough around the same time. And I'd be interested in if those troughs are higher than their previous cycle troughs back when we were in the lowflation period, right, pre-COVID. And if, if they are, 
if they are like, hey, yeah, that's that's I can eyeball that and that's noticeably higher, then then we may be setting in some kind of new inflationary base. And the ingredients for that may be weak weak productivity. It might be onshoring, it could be labor supply being constrained or other types of supply being constrained. But we don't we just don't know yet. I want to take the other side for one second, which is if we've got this really low productivity growth, which which we're observing as best we can, right? It's hard to measure in all of these things. It's definitely hard to forecast. Uh, but if you're in this low productivity environment and you've got relatively weak workforce growth, and both of those things have been present for quite a while now, then your long-term growth potential is is limited. And and so that's something that may just keep activity and even prices down despite all this stuff. So the secular long-term or structural stuff, very hard to predict, right? We could tell narratives around it. But what we can monitor uh, much more actively is kind of the cyclical risk. And and on the cyclical risk for the time being, it's it's to the downside. Locke, let's dive into the chart deck and look for some of the data that confirms the things that we've been talking about. Great, thanks. I uh, I have a whole bunch of charts here, kind of um, uh, touching on uh, a number of places in the United States and globally. We've talked about in our past conversations about labor hoarding and the money illusion and all of these things that are. Um, kind of mucking up the indicators uh, and making things quite confusing right now. But one of the things that I thought was quite interesting in the in the data and in this current cycle is this slowdown that we're having in the service sector. And I have a, a chart on that in the slide deck on uh, on slide five. And typically, um, it's interesting. In, in the chart, we're showing the coincident. A measure of non-financial services and our leading indicator of the non-financial services sector. And that's where most people work. And I think one of the things that's been confusing people is that most cyclical indicators tend to be oriented on the manufacturing, the hard side of the economy. Uh, and we've been monitoring cycles in the service sector since the 80s. So we've, we've been watching these cycles for a very long time. One of the things to, to notice is the coincident index growth rate on the bottom of the chart. It's come down a lot, but it's holding above zero. Uh, and you see that blue line, it's come down pretty pretty darn hard. Now, this is fairly typical where it can, it can, it can hold above zero. If you look at the indicator in front of prior recessions, um, service sector growth often stays positive into the recession. And this current performance is probably augmented by this whole kind of YOLO summer that we've been having. Consumers are just, by, by hook or by crook, they're going to indulge in travel and leisure. And we've been seeing that. I think that's kind of holding that up. But when we switch to the leading index, the kind of plunge you've seen there, it's just recessionary. There's no other way to cut it. And so that is this big part of the economy where all of us work uh, and it's still cycling down pretty darn hard. Now, you've all heard the next slide, you've all heard about how like the consumer is two thirds of the of the economy. And it's definitely accounts for uh, a lot of GDP growth. People have been, the whole soft landing narrative is built around strong consumer, uh, it means strong economy, and therefore, soft landing, not hard landing. But when you look at this chart, you see that the pattern actually contradicts this completely. Consumer spending or personal consumption expenditures, uh, it was definitely the biggest contributor to uh, Q2 GDP growth. Absolutely. No, no argument. And you see it's been surging as a percentage of GDP uh, in the wake of the uh, COVID recession. It's near an all-time high of almost 71%. And so you're like, yeah, the consumer is awesome. We're good to go. Uh, but the catch is that this is exactly what happens around a recession. 
Consumer spending as a percentage of GDP always soars in the run-up to recession. And, and it typically stays in an uptrend until after the end of the recession. And meanwhile, gross domestic private investment as a percentage of GDP, like what are businesses doing? Uh, that's been falling. Uh, despite all the factory building, despite all that CHIPS Act and all that other stuff, this thing is is just plunging. This is typically the pattern you see uh, right going into or inside of a recession. Consumer spending as a percentage of GDP is strong. Investment collapses. And that's what's going on right here. And now, sticking with consumption, moving on to slide uh, seven, we take a quick look at Apple because it's in the news. And here is kind of a snapshot of discretionary consumer spending. It's iPhone revenue globally. And so here you see a lot of growing weakness. Uh, Tim Cook said in, in the most recent call that, and I'm quoting here, the smartphone market has been in a, in a decline for the last couple of quarters. And it's a challenging smartphone market in the U.S. currently. And and you can really see how these have been faltering, and it's a clear cyclical downturn. The, the shaded areas here are growth rate cycle slowdowns, periods of, of slowing U.S. growth. It, totally a discretionary purchase, makes perfect sense, common sense in your head. Next slide, moving on to slide eight, I want to take a stab at what's going on in the jobs market. Here, this has been a big puzzle for everybody. Jobs are strong, so the consumer is strong, so everything's great. So I've already talked about consumer spending, uh, and we've already mentioned that jobs growth is the slowest in over two years, but still people think it's, it's solid. This is one of our cyclical indicators, a cyclical labor conditions index, and it shows that the job market is hollowing out cyclically. That's how I would describe it. This index always turns down decisively before recessions. So it's really interesting to see how strongly it has dropped since last year. And again, this is from a purely cyclical directional point of view. The labor market is weakening the way it does before recessions, even as non-cyclical factors are supporting employment, like the labor hoarding we talked about earlier. Um, so the question we have right now we see the cyclical impulse in the labor market. The question is, how long can non-cyclical forces hold up the labor market in the face of this kind of hollowing out, this showing up? And, and that's an open question. Uh, maybe it's next month or the month after that we see the crack starting to appear in terms of the headline jobs numbers. But this is a crystal clear picture on the direction of where things are headed with cyclical labor conditions. And of course, it's not just the US where things have been weak. If we go to slide nine, if, 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 if listeners look at slide nine, you see the problem in the, in, the, in the other, the second largest economy in the world, this is China. And here we have our Chinese uh, leading index of industrial production growth. And China is just not able to be a source of demand for the global economy. I, I, there was a lot of hope at the beginning of the year when they reopened that uh, we would be off to the races and the recovery was, was here for the world. And this insight into the industrial sector of the Chinese economy uh, really gives lie to that narrative. And the knock-on effects from this weakness are, are really obvious in Europe and Germany. And um, there, it's hitting basically the manufacturing sector around the world. And if you move to slide 10, if listeners go to slide 10 in the deck, you see the global PMIs. And that global PMI is failing. You could see the little bit of a hookup that it took at the beginning of the year. And I think that that kind of hope and that upturn kind of got handed over to some of the fiscal spending. And that, in turn, is the new hope or the YOLO summer and the consumption that the, that the travel and leisure people have been seeing. 
But when we look at these in this global industrial sector, it is not ready to gear just yet. And and you're seeing that uh, in this in this global PMI. So we are certainly hopeful that eventually we get out of this uh, downturn, but there's there's no light at the end of the tunnel just yet. And I think the fact that people have not recognized kind of the the extent of the cyclical weakness is probably just a matter of time. I think that's 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 going to come to the fore in coming months. I've got a couple of questions. Let's go back to slide nine, which is the Chinese leading industrial production index. As we think about, you know, you said it seems like China didn't quite work out the way everybody expected. Well, from a narrative perspective, yeah, it didn't work out the way everybody expected. Everybody was expecting, okay, the pandemic's going to end. China's going to go back to its role of being the supplier of stuff to the whole planet. What happened instead is we've had a rapidly escalating geopolitical situation where the U.S. is almost at war with Russia now, and a lot of geopolitical experts think that the U.S. is headed toward war with China. Okay, obviously, China's not going to continue to be the primary supplier of everything in Walmart if we get to outright war between the U.S. and China. So it seems to me that there's been a major disturbance in the force, that China's role in the world is changing quickly because of what a lot of people think is a coming escalation of tension between the United States and China geopolitically. As a cycles guy, how do you process a, a significant change in the course of world history like that? Do you, do you say, okay, I'm going to go back and look at other cycles where major geopolitical events happened and compare those? Or do you say this is just one of the factors that drives a cycle that, that happens at, you know, at its own rhythm, so to speak? That's an excellent question. It's a, it's a great question, right? Because you're, you're saying, hey, the rules of the game are changing. How do your indicators pick that up, right? How do you factor that in? So our presumption is that market-oriented economies have a cycle. That's our, you, you know, we are, you know, full disclosure, <laughs> that's what we believe. And, and therefore, we've developed leading indexes, what we think are very good leading indexes, that monitor the strength of the drivers of the cycle. That's the, so not the coincident indicators, but the forward-looking indicators. If those are selected well and, and in a diverse way, and I think that they are, that's what we spend our time doing is thinking about that, then implicitly they ought to be picking up where the tire meets the road on the geopolitical tension, the onshoring decisions that have been made, the market forces that are in play. And we, on, on our economic indicators for overall Chinese economic activity, they went up and they said, okay, the recession there is over. Mind you, that was the first recession since Tiananmen Square. Okay. Not a lot of people know that, the, the, the one they had uh, just uh, uh, the year before. So we say, okay, recession's over. What's going on inside of China? Okay, it's the service sector that, that's gearing a bit because people got let out of their houses, right? But what's going on with this industrial component where they plug in to the world economy? And that never geared. You could see on, on the chart on slide nine that that leading index of the industrial sector in China never got traction, regardless of the reopening. And that is a huge tell cyclically, number one, that we weren't off to the races on, say, commodity prices at the beginning of the year. And that two, um, this is implicitly picking up maybe the front edge of the geopolitical tension or the onshoring. Maybe it's picking that stuff up, but it's doing it implicitly. We're not explicitly putting in a number to to make our guess as to the impact of those developments. Another guest who has given us some really fantastic directional calls is Darius Dale. And what he's told me about this market is he said, look, 
we had a growth related event already. That's what, what brought about the first half of the bear market. It's a credit event that's going to bring the second half. And I said, wait a minute, Silicon Valley Bank didn't count as, as your credit event? And he said, no, because that really was a banking liquidity thing. He's talking about uh, in credit markets that there is some kind of disruption that uh, brings about the next leg in the stock market. Uh, as a cycles guy, anything resonate out of that? Are there any cycles that you're watching that are flashing something that might bring about a credit event? Yeah, I would I would say that that observation fully fits with our, our last two discussions, right? So last summer we said, look, the, our cycle indicators are flagging hard landing, and then you had subsequently you had the Fed uh, stomp on the brakes and start raising rates in earnest. Anytime you're in a cyclical downturn, a credit contraction is part of that. There's inventory stuff and credit stuff, and there's all these different things that have to play through. But a credit contraction is definitely part of that. So the Silicon um, uh, Valley banks and these things will get some headlines and, you know, it is what it is. But the real credit event is that your mortgage rate is up or that your car payment is up or that when you go for, you know, your private equity loan, it's tougher. Or, or you know, they're not loaning out. They've got to, they've got to fund everybody who's in their portfolio already. That's where they have to use their cash to keep them afloat to the other side of the cycle. So all of these credit issues are happening. That's why cash is king in your recession, right? You know, that's that's when you can, if you have the cash to go shopping it uh, during a recession, you 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 can get some good deals. And and so I think this cycle is definitely different. We, there's lots of record-breaking charts post-COVID, right? Because of all the extremes we saw there. Uh, I think this cycle is maybe taking a little longer to play out because of uh, all sorts of extremes post-COVID and post-QE, but it's not unexpected. Locke, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. But before I let you go, please tell our listeners a little bit more about what you do at ECRI, which stands for the Economic Cycles Research Institute, how they can follow your work and what services are on offer there for our institutional audience. Sure. Um, well, we do cycle risk management with uh, uh, institutional clients. We're probably different from some others in that We've been doing this for now. We're, we're well into our third generation of doing this cycle um, work. And we're covering 22 economies on growth and inflation. I think some of the most interesting stuff uh, for the United States can be what's going on abroad. And uh, businesscycle.com or uh, Business Cycle on Twitter or Economic Cycle Research Institute on uh, LinkedIn, and, and you can find us, and, and we'd be happy to talk to anybody who is interested in working with us. Patrick Ceresna, Nick Galarnik, and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have Lack back on the show. And joining us again in this post-game segment is Nick Galarnik. Let's get to that chart deck. Listeners, you'll find the download link for the post-game chart deck in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, that means you're not yet registered at MacroVoices.com. Just go to our homepage, MacroVoices.com, and click on the red button over Lack's picture saying, Looking for the Downloads. Eric, let's start off with crude oil, starting with the EIA inventory. EIA printed a build of 5.9 million barrels. Now, normally 5.9 million barrels, that's a super big build, and that's super bearish for prices. But in this particular case, it's after last week's 17 million barrel drawdown. That was an all-time record draw. I'm guessing that some of that was actually in the counting, that some oil that either showed up before the count or after the count, something didn't happen. And I suspect that the 5.9 million barrel build was partially a reflection of the fact that last week's drawdown wasn't really quite as big as it was reported to be. Very much to my surprise, the U.S. government refilled 1 million barrels of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve this week. Now, I had uh, seen comments last week indicating that the Biden administration had basically 
uh, said, look, okay, we're giving up. We're not going to refill it. And they cited market conditions as a reason to not refill it. Now it seems like they are refilling it. So I- I've got some wrong information someplace. Apologies for that. We'll see what happens next. Cushing, Oklahoma, building a de minimis 159,000 barrels. That's on the back of a couple of really big drawdowns over the last couple of weeks. Gasoline drawing down 2.7 million barrels. Distillates drawing down 1.7 million barrels. U.S. production was the surprise on the board, ticking up massively to 12.6 million barrels. That's up 400,000 barrels from last week. And it's also a new post-pandemic record. We couldn't get above 12.3. There was just one weekly print that hit 12.4, and it was back down to 12.2, and it seemed like we were just unable to go past 12.3 million barrels. All of a sudden, it's 12.6. It comes in a week, though, where we've got some kind of funny reporting with other numbers looking bigger and smaller than they usually do. So I'll be very curious to see if that holds. It's going to be very important to see whether or not the U.S. shale patch is is able to continue growing production, especially now that the rig count appears to have peaked. Tape action on this move where there was a big rally move up ahead of inventory. After inventory, that accelerated only for there to be kind of a blow off top as people realized the market had maybe moved too far too fast. We did see a pullback, but it didn't even get back to the five-day moving average. We were from about 84 or 50 or so, got back down to low 83 handle, just above $83. And that's as much of a pullback as we could see before we closed almost back on the highs above $84 at the end of the day on Wednesday. So clearly, this breakout that we're seeing has legs. I do think that we're headed to higher oil prices. But I'm still crossing my fingers for a retest of $77. That's the breakout zone, the 200-day moving average on the continuation chart. If we get a retest of that, I'll lever up my futures position and add to my longs. But at this point, it's probably going to take some weak fundamental news to bring that about because the market's already moved 10% above that level. The slow stochastics are high and tired and wavering. We've got seven green weekly candles in a row here. We've had a short squeeze after the OPEC plus news and so forth. It really makes sense that there ought to be some kind of pullback here. The question is how much? Again, I'm hoping we can get to $77. That's where I would add pretty aggressively to my long position. Meanwhile, our friend Dr. Anas Alhaji says no $100 crude oil in 2023. His thesis is the market's going to stay range-bound with OPEC and particularly Saudi Arabia setting the floor on prices by cutting production in order to get to the price level that they want. I agree completely with Anas on that. The next side of that is Anas says China is going to act as the swing consumer, if you will, and will start selling down their strategic petroleum reserve before we get to $100 crude oil. And Anas thinks that it's going to be China selling down its SPR that's going to moderate the market and prevent prices from running away. He might be right about that for the rest of 2023, but I'm convinced a day of reckoning will come eventually. And unfortunately, I think it will come in the form of China and Russia deepening their military and geopolitical alliance. And potentially someday if Russia and China and heaven forbid, if they get OPEC Uh, on board with them all working on the same team. If they want to starve the West for oil, they will have an almost unlimited ability to do that. So I think that uh, it is entirely possible that China will act as swing producer, but the power that they're going to gain to not act as swing producer, not burn into their strategic petroleum reserve and allow prices to run higher is eventually, I predict, going to be used against the United States as a tool of economic warfare. So I think we are headed ultimately to much higher prices. How long that takes is a matter of time, but it seems like at least the initial move is upon us. Yeah, Eric, looking at this oil chart, it's pretty impressive. We have broken out to uh, new highs for 2023 and uh, certainly broke substantial resistance levels. And I'm with you completely on a retest of a retrace. The 200-day moving average is down around that 77. But what to me, what's interesting will be simply, will crude oil stop the pattern of making lower lows and lower highs? 
at this stage with a higher high, what I want to see is that a pullback occurs. And when it does, it is bought on dip and really solidified that a new uptrend is underway. If we do have any correction, that usually uh, oil has corrections in the 5 to $7 variety. Uh, so that $77 level is right in, in line with what it was a typical correction. If we see that bought on dip, that really puts $90 in play uh, for sometime in the second half of this year. will be really interesting to see if that gets there, but I am generally bullish. Obviously, I prefer buying dips, so we're going to need some sort of pullback to kind of issue a, a new buy signal, but the trend is definitely your friend here. Nonetheless, uh, let's move on to equities. What are you thinking here? Well, the market finally took a pause this week, but the 100-point pullback on the S&P is just noise, in my opinion. If the bearish case that so many of our guests have argued is going to be proven right, that needs to happen pretty soon. And the ride from 4,400 to 4,600 happened so quickly, in the blink of an eye, that we could be back to new all-time highs just as quickly as we got from 4,400 to 4,600. So I'm still sold on the bear arguments making sense fundamentally, but they haven't been playing out in the market yet. On the other hand, from a seasonality standpoint, crash years in the stock market usually involve a top in August, escalating volatility in September, and then October, of course, is the month that everybody remembers. So if the bears are going to be proven right in a big way in Q4, well, the market top coming in August would make perfect sense. So far, though, I don't see any sign of this topping. What I see is an uptrend that's pulling back just a tiny bit, and uh, it's probably going to move higher. Doesn't make sense to me, but uh, at some point, I think we will see a big bear trend. Uh, uh, I'm waiting to see it materialize, though. Yeah, the window to the upside still somewhat remains open, but uh, let me uh, get to that in a moment. First, let's get Nick in the conversation and uh, just find out where the levels are. Nick, uh, what are you watching here, bud? So on SPX right now, the spot price is around 44.70. The call wall above is at 45.50, and the put wall below is at 4,400. We have an implied move for next Friday's August 18th OPEX at plus minus 80 points. That puts our upper expected move at 45.50, right where the call wall is, and lower expected move at 43.90, approximately right below that put wall. Key resistance is at 45.50. Key support is at 4,400, 43.50, then 4,300. Right now, I'm inclined to think that we're going to see a bit more downside, perhaps, to that 4,400 level, given that we've broken below 4,500, as I mentioned last week. Um, I do see a window of weakness into the September OPEX as well, which we'll discuss perhaps next week. But uh, right now, given the earnings season has kind of finished off and we've seen somewhat weak numbers overall, I'm not too impressed. And I do think we see some weakness perhaps before some more strength. Yeah, Nick, in principle, I agree with you. The uh, uh, chart on page four, I have the S&P futures, which are trading just uh, slightly above uh, the spot price you were talking about. We're trading right at 4,500, and we're recording this just as the CPI numbers were released. And the first reaction of the market was to strengthen off of the CPI numbers coming in in line with forecasts, uh, and the dollar initially did weaken on that. But uh, what to me, this 4,500 level on the futures themselves is a very critical level because if we look at a lot of typical uh, market corrections that would last about a week, they would be about a 100-point variety, and they typically would be bought on dip. And we're right at that critical level right now that if this was a bull continuation pattern, this was just like a flagging formation, we should see a bull impulse you know, running this market to 46 or 4,700 on the upside, like Eric was just referencing. But if 4,500 is given out here, if let's say uh, the selling this morning is given back and we start trading below that level, uh, I think 4,400 is too conservative of a short-term uh, low. I mean, if you just use the analog from the February market correction, uh, that was uh, a 300 plus point drop that lasted about a month. If this level is given out and, uh, and we're talking about in the next couple of sessions, then it's very likely that the entire month of August could see uh, pullbacks even as low as 4,300 on the, these S&P futures where the Fibonacci retracement zones lie. And the thing that I'm asking the question, though, is that if uh, we give out 4,500 and start this, 
have we seen the uh, swing high for or the intermediate high of this market? And is the uh, this uh, entire advance that's been going on since October of last year over? Now, uh, that is too early to speculate. Like like uh, Eric was saying, we could uh, slingshot right back to an, a fresh new high on a moment's notice if this level turns. But this is a very toppy market, in my opinion, and the breadth is starting to, uh, to uh, narrow. And so topping formations here can start to form, but it may take um, much of the rest of the summer in order to really solidify this. So it's certainly going to be a conversation we're going to have over the next coming shows. Moving on, though, to the NASDAQ, uh, what are the levels you're watching on the queues here, Nick? On Triple Q right now, the spot price is 369 approximately. We have a call wall above at 380 and a put wall below at 365. Now, the implied move for the August 18th OPEX, which is next Friday, is plus minus 10 points. So the upper expected move is 379 and the lower expected move is 359. And we have key resistance above at 400 and then 409, which are the all time highs, key support below at 370 and then 360. And again, as I mentioned in previous weeks, I do see weakness coming in tech. Um, I'm more favoring the small caps. But again, as you mentioned previously, you know, if the breadth weakens, we could see a, a decline in broad markets, and that would coincide with a decline in the NASDAQ as well, and probably a larger decline than the S&P, for instance, because it's more volatile. So, you know, earnings, I found, again, were pretty overall weak, if you went into, into the, the reports themselves. And I think that Q3 is going to be even worse than Q2, so I don't see really any inclination to go long on a lot of these big tech names. Again, I could be wrong, but I'm, I'm, I'm sticking with it, and I do think that small caps are the better place to put your money right now. You know, Nick, the only concern I have about uh, the idea of the small caps outperforming is if Lack was right uh, during the interview that uh, we may be already in the midst of a recession, small caps have always been the kind of middle America part of the stock market that uh, often is uh, most impacted by a recession. And so, it, you know, even though the Russell has done quite well in the last two months off of those lows, uh, it has been a, overall a very weak index on a relative basis. And uh, if for whatever reason we found ourselves you know, trading all the way back to 1800 on the Russell, it would uh, certainly uh, start doing some uh, technical damage. So uh, I'm, I actually am much more inclined to be more just degrossing equity exposure rather than sector rotating or rotating into uh, different parts of the equity markets. And so I would uh, generally just say, taking uh, um, a risk off is, is my inclination. Nonetheless, uh, let's talk VIX though. We finally saw volatility pop right back in. We were trading right even down even to the 12 handle on the VIX for a while. And, uh, and we now have seen us break out of that entire June, July trade range. And, but yet we're not back into that 18 to 20 uh, levels that we've seen through April and May. Uh, do you think that uh, this is a meaningful turn in vol and that uh, vol will be trending higher from here? Yeah, Patrick, with the VIX at 16-ish, you know, that, that denotes roughly 1% daily moves in broad markets. And we popped off that you know, 12 level pretty, pretty hard. And thinking about where the market's going right now, looking at the past few days, you know, last Friday, for example, we were pushing at you know, 45, 40 on SPX. And in the latter half of the day, the last couple of hours, we sold off 65 points for about a 1.5% 1 per, 1 decline from the top. You know, that to me is, is a signal that we're going to see more volatility. Again, yesterday we saw a very similar move where we, we declined about you know, almost a percent from the top to the bottom recovered that and then sold off into close again. So I'm seeing a lot more volatility in uh, intraday, which to me is, is indicative of more volatility ahead. It is good for selling premium, but you need to be very cautious as well. And I do think that th this forebodes more volatility ahead, which could coincide with a market decline as well. Now on page seven, we have the US dollar index. What are your thoughts here? Not much new to report here. The dollar has recovered from its temporary breakdown below 100 on the Dixie, as we reported last week. That fake break has so far not brought about a new uptrend or a, a vigorous new rally. We're just grinding along in the consolidation range. I find it very interesting where we are on the dollar. Now, while we certainly have seen uh, a substantial retracement of that very ugly July drop, where we dropped from almost uh, five points to the downside from that one with three and a half down towards uh, under uh, towards 99. But one of the interesting things about the current rally 
is is that we uh, basically saw about just a, over a three point bounce higher up towards 103 on the dollar index. What's interesting is that if you look at what happened in the dollar rally back in May, we also rallied about three and a half points uh, in about 23 days or roughly uh, three weeks. And so this resembles a lot of the same type of a market bounce. And back in May, that rolled over and sold again. And so the question is, are we uh, seeing a similar style scenario where we just had a market react from an oversold condition and it just rolls over and sells? This is uh, going to be the, uh, the part to really watch here. The way I look at it, the little weakness that we got here after the CPI print that is trading us down to this 102 level uh, we want to see whether the bulls defend this. If this is a, a legitimate bottoming formation on the dollar and we are destined to be far more in the trade range of the, that we've established throughout the entire year, that sort of 101 to 105 level, then the bulls will buy the dip here. And so we're going to see in the next one point lower on the Dixie whether or not that pattern starts to emerge of all dips being bought and the price action gets back towards the top end of the ranges. If Lack is right about the recession call and the risks of that, I still am in the view that the dollar will do relatively well as a safe haven asset during a risk-off impulse and the real question is, when do we see some sort of a risk-off impulse get underway? Right now, uh, the dollar is not showing any um, any sign of, of uh, the market being nervous, but uh, will the lows stand here? And uh, the level to watch, in my mind, is definitely the 101 level. Now, on page eight, we have the gold futures chart. What are your thoughts here, guys? I remain extremely bullish long term, but I think the correction that gold is undergoing probably has farther to go to the downside. We saw a nice rally after many market participants convinced themselves that surely, surely after the Silicon Valley Bank debacle, the Fed would never dare to raise interest rates ever again. Well, now that the markets are back in touch with reality and no longer expecting an imminent reversal of Fed policy, gold is hunkering in to weather a monetary policy storm that could last another year and could involve two or three more rate hikes before the Fed is eventually forced to cut rates despite persistent inflation. I'd also like to point out a charting anomaly which I think is affecting the gold market right now. Normally, gold traders don't give much attention to the contango and backwardation in the market. You have to roll your position forward when the contract you were trading expires, but the difference between the contract that you just traded out of and the one you traded into is like a dollar or two. Nobody cares. Nobody pays attention. It's not important. That's because we used to have zero interest rates. But now that we have zero interest rates again, the August gold futures contract, which is expiring, is trading at a $40 discount to the December contract, which has become the new front month contract. So that $40 difference completely changes. The guy who's got the August contract still on his chart is looking at something completely different from the guy who's rolled his contract over to the December contract, and he's looking at a different price. So what does that actually mean in terms of the market? It means technical analysis is going to get a little bit less reliable in the gold market for a while because different people are looking at different charts that say different things. And therefore, the self-fulfilling prophecy aspect of technical analysis isn't working very well. Yeah, Eric, it was interesting uh, that that roll uh, from the August to the uh, December contract did a pretty big gap on those charts. But the interesting thing in general, though, for me, I mean, let's just analyze the December chart on its own so the continuous doesn't factor in. We're trading right back to the June lows. And generally, uh, gold has not really moved strong off of those uh, off of those lows that were established in June. And so generally, gold is in a very distributive pattern, rallies failing, and uh, this usually indicates that there is some more weakness to come. And this kind of fits that bigger intermarket story because gold does best during an easing cycle when, when things have already broken. And uh, during risk-off impulses, gold tends to behave uh, very much in line with a lot of other risk assets. So this idea that gold may on the short term dip lower 
and then rally um, maybe later in the year, if not in the start of next year, I think is uh, increasing probability at this moment. If we do see gold even trade down to uh, 1850 or 1900, I'm going to be paying attention to see whether or not that's where the key lows come in. Finally, I wanted to, though, uh, just uh, talk about two other charts. Uh, I wanted to put up the 210 U.S. Treasury curve. And what's interesting is, is that we had a bit of a steepener kick in in the last couple of weeks. And the thing is, is that, that w what drove that steepener? It wasn't a bull steepening. And this is important because a lot of those that have been waiting for this curve to steepen as some sort of evidence that we, we are in a recession or that the market's about to break. Uh, I don't know uh, whether I would trust this one because ultimately this came on a break of the 10s more than it was a bull steepener with the twos already starting to sniff out the recession. And so when I see that this really starts to move more on a bull steepening basis, then I would put more significance on it. But it is reasonable that that minus 1% level that we traded at in, uh, throughout July really probably was the low end and probably will be the low of this curve. And we'll see whether or not we finally see some sort of a bull steepener kick in to really indicate that the markets are, are rolling over. Finally, I wanted to, uh, to touch on the Eurostock 50 index on the page 10. And what's interesting is that all of these highs that we saw earlier in the year around 4,400 was quite a significant resistance level that lined up with uh, major previous highs in, in the past decade. Uh, we attempted to, in July, break out to a fresh new high above that 4,400 level, and it was spectacularly rejected. I think the euro stock will correlate with global equity and particularly the S&P, but it'll be really interesting to see whether or not any bounces we see here remain below 4,400. If we do, then this could already be marking some of the key tops uh, in the European markets. And it's certainly the thing to watch in the coming week. Folks, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading. The details are on the last pages of the slide deck or just go to bigpicturetrading.com. Patrick, tell them what they can expect to find in this week's research roundup. In this week's research roundup, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, LAX slide deck, and the chart book we just discussed here in the post game, and a number of links to articles that we found really interesting. So you're going to find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. Well, that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make this program even better. For those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at Research Roundup at macrovoices.com, and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend, that is Eric spelled with a K, and follow Patrick at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend, Patrick Serezna, and myself, thanks for listening, and see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. 
Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.